When I was in grad school, uh, I think I had three heroes, uh, Monty Slatkin, Joe Felsenstein and Russ Landy, and they've all talked this afternoon. Uh, so it's pretty nerve-wracking for me to be up here, and I'm quite amazed I am, actually. But it does mean you're all older than me, so that's uh, something, I suppose. So I'm going to be talking today about um, some work that I've been doing with Russ. Um, I'd like to say artfully disguised here as a dean. Um, John Powers and Maria Cervadio, who sort of led the work. Um, and it all comes out of the quantitative genetic um, research that I was introduced to when I went to Chicago uh, in 84. Um, yeah, I was thinking it's more like 1984 now than it was then. But um, uh, at that time, there was this famous class, Landy, Arnold and Wade, or Law, and I was delighted to take it. Uh, a few years later, Charlesworth joined in, and it, uh, Russ told me it changed into Claw, so I'm not quite sure, sure if it was the same. Um, but uh, when I went there, uh, Mark Kirkpatrick was on, um, he used to call it field work, away from his Miller postdoc in Berkeley. And he and uh, Steve had uh, decided they were going to work on sexual selection in monogamous birds. And that came from... Um, uh, scrutinizing this diamond of Fisher's. So Fisher in 1930 didn't have this diamond in his first edition of the book. He talked about Darwin's exceedingly subtle uh, model of sexual selection in monogamous birds. And obviously, uh, Steve had read the 58 edition and uh, Fisher had come up with this diamond. And uh, so Mark and Steve had decided to do a... Uh, uh, a model of this, and I think I kind of muscled in. I said, well, basically I was a bird guy, and uh, neither of those guys were actually doing birds for their work. In fact, you know, uh, actually one of my favorite anecdotes from that time was, uh, you know, I'd never do herbs because, you know, pick up a snake, it's possibly poisonous, right? I mean, but every picture you see of a herpetologist, they got like three snakes hanging out. Well, uh, <laughs> I think my favorite quote as a postdoc was that uh, the uh, International Herpetology Congress was going to be in Australia that year, which Steve informed me had the highest fraction of poisonous snakes in the world. So he said he was going to buy a one-way ticket because he knew there'd be a spare seat on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so, you know, uh, Russ had asked me to come, well, Russ had found some money, actually, in one of his many retention funds for me to be in Chicago to work with him, but then he probably went off on sabbatical, so I was just basically hanging around. And, uh, um, yeah, this diamond was there. So Mark, I think, said, well, why don't you join in? Because you know something about birds or something. So we looked at this diamond, and it really, I think, was the most intellectually trying time of my life, because... Uh, Mark said, none of us could figure it out, as far as I remember to begin with. And then Mark said, I got it. And this is the, this is the picture that he showed me. And I still don't understand it. It was a square box with a normal curve at a 45 degree angle on the far corner. So, you know, OK, Mark, you've got it. And it really stressed me out for a day. But he convinced me he got it, because the next day we had things like this appearing. <laughs> And I was, uh, you know, still mired in, you know, what really is going on? How do we explain? Basically, the issue is, according to Darwin, early breeding females would give an advantage to uh, males because they were fitter and healthier. But if they were fitter and healthier, the question is, why doesn't breeding date move forward? So, uh, yeah, I had an ice cream. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I came up with this picture, which sort of satisfied me, but I think uh, Steve and Mark thought, um, that's just two of uh, Fisher's squares, which, you know, in reflection, it was. It was basically what Fisher already got in his diamond, so I don't think it helped them at all. And anyway, Mark was already off in math land. But then the light fell from our eyes when Steve came in and drew an Arnold diagram. And this, I think, uh, basically... Um, Dolph, a good friend of mine, said, uh, you done anything else? Because this explains it all. And, uh, yeah, that was the way forward. Uh, and I think um, 
if you look at this plot, you can see that there's this thing called nutritional state, which affects breeding date and affects fitness, <clears throat> but is not heritable. But there's still a heritable component that affects breeding date. But that bit, or breeding date, doesn't directly affect fitness. So this uh, path diagram, to my mind, explains why you see directional selection on traits all over the place that are heritable. Uh, and, you know, basically, I think uh, Steve solved it with this path diagram. But still, we see papers every other year coming out about why there's directional selection on heritable traits. Uh, uh, and I think Steve and Mark moved on pretty quickly. But I've been mired in this uh, ever since. And I would say that this and then the work I did with Russ later, probably, you know, these two guys moved on, but I probably think about a third of my work since then has been stimulated by that diagram and things uh, to do with quantitative genetics that came out of it. So we wrote one paper there, and then we wrote this famous, well, not famous, sorry, this other paper <laughs> um, uh, on the theory of sexual, we really tried to put it all together into this um, sexual selection of monogamous birds theory of Darwin. And, uh, you know, I thought I was the bird person, but actually, about if you look at the discussion, about half of it's been clearly written by Steve. And uh, he spent some time discussing Huxley in... Uh, uh, and Huxley had a lot of ideas about monogamous birds because he studied um, monogamous birds that formed strong pair bonds. And uh, we were talking about mate choice there, so Steve had a big section about what Huxley said about mate choice. But uh, actually, you know, Huxley's famous uh, review in 1938 uh, forms a starting point for what I want to talk about today. So uh, Huxley said um, competition between males and mates is not a common phenomenon postulated by Darwin, but it's confined to relatively few species practicing polygamy or with a high excess of males. In most monogamous birds, display begins only after pairing up for the season has occurred. So, uh, as an issue, there's no mate choice here. Why are all these displays um, happening after pairing up? Well, we now know, of course, there is quite a bit of sexual selection in monogamous birds, not just for Darwin's reason, but for things like extra pair copulations and so on. But nevertheless, uh, uh, I don't think that these displays have got much to do with mate choice, and um, Huxley emphasized that they could be just stimulating the female to come into reproductive condition. Um, and the, the paradox is that if you are in a pair and you stimulate the female to come into reproductive condition by displaying to her, you're wasting a bunch of energy that that pair could presumably put into raising young. So, you know, if you could not display, and you and your wife, well, as I, I like to put it, why bring home flowers when you could suckle the babies instead? Uh, that's the basic conundrum. So, uh, you know, Huxley said all this, and then uh, there was this, what I think of as the resurrection of sexual selection in 1972, uh, with this book by Bruce Campbell, and that book was full of chapters heavily referring to Huxley, uh, more than Darwin. But no one can say that nowadays. It's all Darwin and no Huxley. And in fact, uh, if you talk about uh, sexual selection, these are, uh, these are the rare groups that Huxley pointed to uh, that really are polygamous. Um, there's a lot of the, the lek-forming species. We've got uh, mannequins, birds of paradise in the middle, grouse, um, pheasants, and bowerbirds. Each one of these groups has been studied to hell, actually. Everyone's studying them. And it's, they've been modeled a lot as well. And they're clearly examples of sexual selection through mate choice. But about, um, that's about 700 species of birds that we might lump into that category. The other 9,300 form long-term pair bonds. Yeah, let's think about that. Along with um, some primates in this room. Uh, not many other organisms, but... Uh, my co-author, who happens to be sitting here, will not allow me to talk about primates when I talk about this talk, so it's all going to be about birds. Uh, so this is a pair of ring doves, and uh, the male displays to the female uh, long after they've formed a pair bond, 
And in many of these pair bonding species, they go right through the season and then they reform the next year. Okay? And some of these pair bonding species create you know, really rather remarkable displays which are maximized in these grebes, which uh, these are hooded grebes from the Andes, which uh, actually have an orchestra that they, <laughs> that they have beside them. Somehow I got the same slide in again. But <laughs> so, uh, so we want to try and understand these displays that are happening long after pair formation. And uh, um, we're going to argue they haven't got much to do with sexual selection. They're something to do with maintaining the pair bond. And I'm going to emphasize this psychophysiological stimulative functions. Well, uh, you know, after Huxley, there was quite a bit of work on this, and it's clear that male displays are essential to bring females into reproductive condition. This is a very famous um, paper by Lehrman, which uh, if you have a female with no male there, she doesn't develop overducts. If you have a castrated male behind a glass, uh, she develops the over... The castrated male doesn't display, she, um, she just uh, develops overduct, but, you know, not much. But when you have a displaying male behind the glass, she comes into full reproductive condition just as if she was mated towards uh, with a normal male. So it's clear that these traits are required to bring females into reproductive condition. So how do they evolve? Well, you know, the model that we're going to start with is that perceptual biases affect female investment. So the idea is that if you're starting with a display already, and then a male can do something more that will cause the female to increase their investment. This can provide a starting point for the display to evolve further. And uh, for completely different reasons, uh, we've now got a lot of evidence that these perceptual biases do increase investment. So that started with Nancy Burley's work where she put color bands on male zebra finches. And here's a male zebra finch looking very happy because the female's looking at him. And she showed that in, in this case, if a female was paired with a male with bright red color bands, he would have twice the reproductive output. He would have twice the reproductive output of a female compared to the male with blue bands. Oh, that's right, sorry. And uh, this is because the female worked harder. That stimulated an enormous amount of work. Uh, I've reviewed this stuff. There's 27 species that have now been studied experimentally, many of them in the field. Uh, these are two examples that were done after pair formation. Enlarge the size of the fly, pied fly catches white forehead patch. She lays more eggs. And uh, increase the number of stones a wheat ear carries, and she'll lay more eggs. It doesn't only happen male stimulation of female. In these um, yellow leg gulls, if you paint the red, if you paint the beak red, the other sex will bring more food to the nest, and it doesn't matter which sex you paint the beak. And in this um, yellow-throated sparrow, if you, uh, males and females have both got yellow throats. If you make the yellow throat bigger uh, on the female, the male starts defending the nest uh, more. So I'm going to uh, go back to Huxley's. Uh, Huxley came, you know, pondered all this because he studied uh, these great crested grebes in England uh, for part of his, well, I think, for his doctoral. I don't know what for. <laughs> Anyway, great crested grebes are cool because there's a non-breeding plumage and then both sexes come into breeding plumages and they perform dances. Um, maybe I'll show you the dance at the end, but that dance ends with this uh, weed shake together. It's, they're slightly sexually dimorphic, the females on the left, the males on the right. They then engage in rearing the brood. Here they are swimming around with their chicks and one's bringing fish to the other one. And it really does look, I'm sorry, Russ, that they're in love, you know? So, you know, how, does, how do these displays evolve? Well, we started off with the idea that um, in monogamous birds, if two birds are investing in the brood, both birds are going to get a higher payoff than if neither bird is investing. So supposing you start with a situation where neither bird is investing and the payoff is two. 
And then one bird invests, and because it's investing, it has a cost. So its fitness goes down, and the other one doesn't invest, it gets the benefit from the investing. But if they were both to invest, then they would both be better off, and it wouldn't be worth one of them defaulting because it would have a lower fitness now than if it was to carry on investing. So how do you get from a, no, a don't invest to an invest situation? Well, uh, the model that we basically first developed said, let's supposing we've got a display which uh, arises that causes the, uh, the recipient of the display to invest. That display will increase in frequency because the fitness of that displayer is, uh, has a value of three over anything else. And what will happen is the display will increase in frequency to such an amount that now two displayers will meet each other and reciprocally cause each other to invest more. So you go over a threshold where then you go to final fixation and everyone is displaying and investing and any default on that, uh, you know, it's a stable equilibrium because if anyone defaults, they go back down to a three. So we built a haploid genetic model. It's haploid for reasons uh, just to simplify the system. We made sure there's no sexual selection by enforcing random mating in strict monogamy, and we kept the sexes identical. So we basically have um, a responder allele, a big A allele, in the f uh, which would be in the female. I mean, sorry, in one, in, you have responder alleles and you have display alleles. And when you've got a big A responder and a big B display, you invest more. If you've got any of the other combinations, you invest less. And then the basic model display comes with a viability cost. Costs of investment are paid after mating, which creates this issue that you have to survive to the next breeding season because some have to survive disproportionately better than others. That creates this issue of overlapping generations, which was a very difficult thing for me not to deal with, for others to deal with. And we have uh, possibilities of divorce and death, so you don't always mate with the same individual. Two classes only, juveniles and adults, juvenile fitness affected by parents, adult fitness affected by investment. So one, me one, one member of the pair invests, the fecundity increases by a factor F, and now we have to have this synergism whereby if you're in a monogamous pair, you elevate the fitness over more than what would be the additive amount of 2F, and that's given by this uh, value rho. So if rho is zero, there's no uh, excess uh, benefit to both investing, then you end up with a simple balance. If the cost of investment's more than the benefit, you end up not investing. If the benefit's more than the cost, you end up investing. But either way, you don't get a display. But if you have uh, an interaction, then as I showed with the sort of toy model, there's a region of space where uh, the display becomes fixed and permanently man maintained. I want to emphasize it's permanent. Once you, once you get this display, you can't get out of it because as soon as you stop displaying, um, you're, both, of, both individuals' fitness goes down. So this was a, you know, the first model that we did, and it was just a model of if there is a synergistic effect, a cooperative effect between the two individuals, uh, is this something that would promote the evolution of these displays? And the answer is yes. So... Um, we want to talk now about what we'd really like to know is how does the cooperation, it's, or, or can these displays lead also to an increase in cooperation? So what we've been doing since then is modeling how a display will interact with cooperate, uh, how a display itself can generate cooperation between individuals. So what I'm going to do now is just focus on the system whereby a male uh, is stimulating a female, as in the zebra finches. You put red color bands on a, on a zebra finch and the male uh, stimulates the female to work harder. So we're just gonna be talking about now sex, uh, sex, two sexes rather than just two individuals in those mutual displays. So the idea is we've got a, uh, a pre-existing sensory bias in the female which um, a male trait can evolve... Uh, microphone trouble. Oh, shit. So, good, I was away from the microphone, yeah, wasn't I? <laughs> That's why I went away. Um, uh, 
we've got we've got you know a couple of fairy wrens here. The male and female are hunky dory on the left, and a male signal arises that causes a female to invest an extra egg in the brood. So there's a pre-existing bias in the female for this extra blue. Now the standard model is a model of sexual uh, conflict, whereby um, female resistance evolves. She stops looking at the blue. And eventually what would happen then is, because the blue has some cost associated with it, the blue gets lost, you go back to the original system. And I, whenever I talk about this, I talk about Cracker and Johnston's paper, because I think it's a pretty brilliant paper that's a bit under-recognized. And I see I haven't got too much longer here. But you, oh, yes, I do. Yeah, I do. It's 30 minutes, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so this, you know, is one... Uh, this is a model that is common in the literature, that a male signal uh, arises, causes the female to uh, invest beyond her optimum, but it gives a benefit to the male because there's death and divorce, so he doesn't mate with her every year for his life. But there's another uh, alternative outcome that I think we should be considering seriously here, which is as soon as the female's above her optimum, so she's laying four eggs, there's two solutions. One is the one we just went through on the bottom, where she stops looking at the male trait and doesn't get stimulated by it anymore. The other one is where she continues to look at the male trait and her investment evolves back down to a normal level. So now she's back at her optimal level for investment. And this should be a stable equilibrium because if the male loses his blue, she'll only lay two eggs. And if the female stops looking at the blue, she'll only lay two eggs. So we're actually stuck again for eternity where we've got the male display required to raise the female uh, to the level that's optimal for both. So we use the same model, uh, or we adapted the same model, um, monogamy and random mating, no sexual selection, overlapping generations, divorce and death now generate conditions for sexual conflict. And the display, importantly, comes with either mortality or fecundity costs. So the male display could actually cause a reduction in the um, number of eggs being produced because he's displaying. So you can actually, you know, you're, you can end up with a cost to the female at the same time as you're increasing her response. So we have the two genes that we had before, one gene, two alleles uh, for female response, one for male display. But now we have investment, and I'm just going to call it clutch size, but it's a quantitative trait, so it can vary continuously from two, or, you know, according to the classic normal distribution. So, uh, you know, just put them together. If you've got um, uh, a female who's got the responder big A and the male is, uh, in the pair has got a display big B, she lays four, uh, and this is a female who would normally lay two eggs, she lays four eggs because she's got this responder and display allele. So it's a, uh, the clutch size is continuous. So you know, if, if there was a female whose baseline was three eggs, she'd be laying five if she had the response allele and was paired with a male with a display allele and so on. So you, know, you have to numerically iterate this, but this basically shows you the sort of um, pattern you get when you uh, end up with uh, sexual conflict. Um, uh, so what's happening here, let's just, to fill you in, you've got the blue line is the female response. That starts at a very high frequency because that's the hidden perceptual bias that the female has. The brown is the male display. And what we do is we introduce the male display. The uh, green is clutch size, and we start clutch size off at its optimum before we introduce the male display. So the male display uh, starts to increase because the female, females that the male mates to, all of them pretty much are responders, and in this case, they lay two extra eggs. But that's very bad for the female, so her response and her clutch size start to evolve down again. You can see the green goes down a bit and the response goes down a bit. But in this example, with a two egg increase, the female response goes and is lost, and then finally the male display is lost, and the basal clutch guys falls back to the optimum in the classic sexual conflict model. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is wrong, this is sexual conflict evolved by a uh, change in investment. We do the same thing again, 
where we uh, start the female response in blue high, everything is exactly the same. The male display is introduced at a, a, a low level, but this time the investment just causes an increase of one egg. And in that case, uh, what happens is the, female, the clutch size evolves back to its optimum faster than the female response is lost. And we end up at the end, on the right here, with uh, a clutch size that's back at the optimum because uh, all the individuals are displaying and responding, and the mean basal clutch size is below the optimum. So we've ended up with permanent fixation of the display and investment. So we can sort of summarize, you know, we can search for the parameter space where these occur. And uh, the, uh, on the x-axis here, we've got the amount that the male is stimulating the female to invest more. And on the y-axis, we've got the cost to the female of laying one extra egg. So uh, as I sort of indicated, when the cost to the female is uh, reasonably high uh, uh, and the investment increase is reasonably low, you end up with an area where the display is permanently fixed. When the investment increase is much higher, then the uh, resistance gene evolves first, and you end up losing it altogether. And this red space here, which I can talk about more later on, if you want me to, is, a, is the place where it's not advantageous for the female to, or for the male even to display. You can sort of see that here. If a male comes up with a display, there's a cost to the display. He's not getting much benefit so the display itself gets lost. So we have these three situations. Display never establishes. Permanent cooperation or resistance evolves. The point is that if you get to the permanent cooperation situation, there's no getting out of it. You're stuck there for eternity. So the conclusions then, our sexual conflict evolves into permanent cooperation, which can't be cheated. And our displays are present solely to raise the reproductive condition of the sexes. It kind of supports uh, Huxley's uh, was a model that, you know, we can finally sort of begin to understand what Huxley was talking about. And I just want to end by saying, you know, uh, if you look at the literature on birdsong these days, there's just two things that uh, birds, is, males are supposed to sing. One is female attraction, the other one is male competition. But if you looked at the literature on birdsong 60 years ago, uh, Fernando Notterbaum, for example, would say there were three reasons that males sing. Female attraction, male competition and female stimulation. And I think it's really time that we think a lot more about, um, you know, just keeping your female happy as a reason that these traits have evolved. Good. Finished. No time for questions. Thank you. The male displays. Yes, but in your in your greaves, the females were also displayed. Right. Are there ever cases where females display in a non-socially monogamous species? Yeah, like the bowerbirds are a classic example where the male displays and the female basically tells the male that you're displaying too much or too little. So there were these elegant experiments done by Gail Patricelli where she uh, had a female robot bowerbird and she could show that, you know, she can manipulate the male display by making the female bowerbird uh, do the wrong thing or the right thing. Uh, uh, I don't know. So this, the example I gave you was just mate choice again. Sorry, that's what I thought you asked me about. Within pairs, of course, females do display a lot, like the Grebes. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's just got to be a cost balance thing. They're sitting on the eggs. If they come out and start displaying to the male, the eggs are not, you know, they can have a bigger cost to the display than the male would. Something like that. No, I think you can't get out of it anymore. <laughs>